This month on In Case You Missed It, the story of an enslaved couple, William and Ellen Craft, who posed as master and slave during the mid-1800s in an epic journey to freedom. Meet the best-selling author who has turned their remarkable story into a new book. Noise pollution was first declared a public health hazard in 1968, but experts say the problem is only getting worse. Rhode Island PBS Weekly's continuing Green Seeker series investigates the noise. Providence's new mayor, Brett Smiley, says that well over 40% of the land in Providence is tax exempt, which means that 60% of the people are paying 100% of the bill. Hear more about his plan to negotiate with colleges, hospitals, and other nonprofit institutions in the city so that they can help contribute more. With their vibrant colors and robust songs, birds have a palette and sound unlike anything else in nature. Art Inc. gives you a glimpse into the world of these beautiful creatures from a conservationist and avian researcher's point of view. All this and much more in case you missed it. Welcome to In Case You Missed It, where we look back at some of the best local content on Rhode Island PBS, plus give you a sneak peek at exciting new content coming soon to your screen. In our first story, David Wright interviews best-selling author Ilion Wu about her new book, Master Slave Husband Wife, an epic journey from slavery to freedom. Set in the mid-1800s, Wu tells the story of an enslaved couple, William and Ellen Craft, who made a daring escape across more than a thousand miles. It took me a long time to get to the story. Then what ended up happening is I started looking into the history. And what I found in the archives was so revelatory um, about the crafts, but also yielding this bigger picture of our nation. I think one that's very much relevant today that I felt compelled as an American scholar to tell the story. Author Ilion Wu's new book, Master, Slave, Husband, Wife, tells the story of William and Ellen Craft and their daring flight to freedom. This is 1848, yes. pre-Civil War, and this couple, a married couple, uh, enslaved to different masters, mm -hmm. sets out from Macon, Georgia. It's harrowing because the stakes are so high, right? Because at any moment, if they are caught, if they're captured, they will inevitably be separated, tortured, or killed. They were not hiding. They were not um, going underground. They were traveling above ground on actual railroads. Uh, this out is not in the, the underground open. railroad. Yes. This is the overland normal railroad. Exactly. And she, Ellen Craft, mm -hmm. is passing not yes. only as a white person, but as a white gentleman. As a white disabled man. So she is going from being really at the bottom of the social hierarchy as an enslaved woman to the very top. The disability was a crucial part of the disguise. She had her arm in a sling. She doesn't have the poultices on her face here, but she's got her glasses, she's got her tie and her white shirt and everything. Dressing as a privileged man staved off questions. Her overall appearance of vulnerability bolstered her cover story of being a slaveholder who needed help from his valet to travel. What was the disability that she pretended to have? So it was a, it was a combination of different disabilities, I think, that could be improvised on, uh, depending on where she was and what she needed. But she, the general complaint was rheumatism. Um, I think this is also a time of uh, a global pandemic, the cholera, and people are afraid of getting different kinds of diseases. So you need her to be sick, but not so much that you're afraid of getting sick from her. Of course, the key feature of her disguise was something she came by naturally, a light complexion. So she's very light skinned, mm -hmm. partly because her master is her father, her biological father. Yes, her first enslaver was also her biological father and so from him she inherited this very light complexion which so unnerved and upset his legal wife that she at the soonest opportunity wanted to get rid of Ellen. Ellen Craft's enslaver, her biological father, 
gave her away as a wedding present to another of his daughters. Ellen becomes the slave of her biological half-sister. And, and meanwhile, she strikes up a relationship with William Craft, she who does. is enslaved to a different master. Mm -hmm. And he is a skilled craftsman. So he is a cabinet maker and she is a seamstress. She was all of 22 when she and her husband set off from Macon. But this escape, while out in the open, mm -hmm. has no shortage of potential points of danger. Oh my gosh, no. Yeah, right from the get-go. I mean, there's danger at every turn. The cabinet maker shows up. Oh my gosh, yeah. No sooner did the Crafts board the train, but William Craft's employer turned up at the station looking for him. You can watch the full story at ripbs.org slash weekly. From wailing ambulance sirens to bustling highways, the list of sounds heard on a regular basis is seemingly endless. It's called noise pollution, and experts say the problem has only become worse, yet little has been done to address it. In this story, Rhode Island PBS Weekly's Michelle San Miguel talks with researchers who are studying noise pollution, as well as community members affected by it. On the weekends, it legitimately sounds like I'm, I live next to a racetrack, and, and it's not the interstate, it's the cars on Dean and Atwell's. Frank Broom knew it would be noisy when he moved to Providence's Federal Hill neighborhood. But he says the sounds he hears from his apartment are louder than he imagined. I really never expected this, but there are cars that have speakers on the outsides of their cars. But it's like shocking how I'll hear not just bass, but I can hear clear lyrics. Over on the northeast side of Providence, <coughs> Sam Howard is also frustrated. This is a lot of noise. There's a siren going off right now. We can hear vehicle noise happening. Um, late at night when folks are making their liquor runs, we have a liquor store nearby. People are chatting and yelling and playing music. He lives in the city summit neighborhood, less than two blocks from Miriam Hospital. But the siren sound that we're hearing right now, that's pretty common around here. That, I mean, that's all day, yeah. Howard says he feels discouraged by the constant barrage of noise. It's often loud that I don't really want to be outside, right? I'd rather be inside, and I think that causes harm to, like, social fabric. I'm not running into neighbors as much as I should be. Both Howard and Broom invited students from a Brown University research lab to measure the noise level for themselves. Nina Lee has collected dozens of noise samples in Providence. She sets up monitors in backyards and front porches around the city and leaves them there for a week. I would never be able to hear what you're saying, but I can see that, for example, at 8 p.m., there was a high burst of sound at a specific frequency. Erica Walker is the founder of Brown University's Community Noise Lab and an assistant professor of epidemiology. Sound is basically anything that you can process through your auditory system, anything that you can hear. But when we move from sound to noise, we go from things that we like to hear to things that we don't want to hear. Walker is interested in how noise affects a community's health. Before she moved to Rhode Island, she spent years monitoring and studying disruptive noises in Boston. How noisy is Rhode Island compared to other places you've been, like Boston specifically? Providence in particular is really loud. It's, it's, it's on the lines of what I measured when I was in Boston. You're saying that Providence is as loud as Boston? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yes. Walker says it's no surprise that the biggest contributor to noise in the city is transportation. From bustling highways, rumbling trains. You can watch the full story on ripbs.org slash weekly. And don't forget to tune in for new episodes of Rhode Island PBS Weekly, Sundays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore on Wednesdays. Stunning colors, beautiful melodies, and the ability to fly. These are just a few reasons to be enthralled by birds. In this next segment, learn more about our feathered friends and the art of conservation from Charles Clarkson, Director of Avian Research at the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. If you want to know what's going on...
My name is Charles Clarkson, and I am the Director of Avian Research for the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. The Audubon Society is a large uh, national conservation organization that is devoted to conserving birds and the habitats that they rely on. James Audubon was a collector and there is no doubt that a big part of what kind of pushed him to do what he did was this desire to fill in the avian community for us to get a better handle on what the diversity is and how birds interact with each other and with the environment around them. But there's no shortage throughout his writings uh, where he just professes about how beautiful the birds are that he's out and he's witnessing. And I think there's that connection for anybody who studies birds. you're a backyard birder. The reason you're doing it is because you are attracting these birds that you find absolutely beautiful and meditative, you know, and you can sit on your back deck all day long and watch these vibrant blue jays and red cardinals and yellow warblers. I am no artist, but I cannot deny that birds are like a palette unlike anything else on this planet. Having big fleshy appendages or traits on your feathers or producing a song that is incredibly robust and dynamic, all in an effort to be the male that, that is successful at, at uh, attracting a, a mate or repelling rivals and, and gaining a territory. Watch new episodes of Art Inc. Mondays at 7 p.m. with an encore Fridays at 8 p.m. Also on demand at ripbs.org slash artinc. Moving on to politics, a lively experiment host Jim Hummel recently sat down with Providence Mayor Brett Smiley to discuss negotiating with nonprofit institutions to pay property tax on certain buildings. Facing uh, financial challenges, Mayor Brett Smiley is putting together a legislative package. He wants to go back to the nonprofits, the, the colleges, the universities, and the big hospitals to get them to squeeze out a little bit more. It's called payment in lieu of taxes, but basically to help contribute, as he says, 40% of the tax base um, is tax exempt. I had a chance to sit down with him last week. Here's a little bit of what he told me. Your garbage pickup, your police protection, your fire service, streets and sidewalks, snow removal, that's all funded by property taxes. And, and now well over 40% of the land in Providence is tax exempt, which means that 60% of the people are paying 100% of the bills. And that number gets worse, not better every year. So the discussion about nonprofits contributions to the city services, that's been going on for decades. But you're putting this right on the front burner. I am, you know, this is the year. Uh, it has been decades. It's been exactly 20 years, in fact. Uh, Mayor Cicilline negotiated the first payment for payments in lieu of taxes with the private colleges in 2003. That was a 20-year agreement, and it has now finally expired. Do you, for institutions of higher learning, you got Brown, RISD, uh, Johnson & Wales, and Providence College. Do you look at them as a whole, or do you treat individually when you come down to actual numbers? So they've decided amongst themselves that they're going to negotiate as a group. We're going to agree on a total number, and then they're going to make uh, payments proportional to their institution size. So Brown will pay the majority of whatever payment is ultimately agreed to. I'm not uh, antagonistic towards these institutions. They're really important to our economy, our economy as a whole. And I don't necessarily begrudge them wanting to control their future growth. But if they want to buy a building because they think at some point in the future they may want to use it for institutional use, they need to keep paying taxes on it until such time as they do use it for institutional use. And that's a, a piece of legislation that we've now filed with the state that I've told the colleges and hospitals that we have filed and, and hope that they uh, will not fight. Watch a lively experiment Fridays at 7 p.m. with an encore Sundays at noon. Also on demand at ripbs.org slash lively. Our latest installment of Our Town visits the beautiful seaside town of Little Compton, home to a mix of summer and year-round residents who share a fondness for small town living. 
Almost a third of the land in Little Compton is conserved, something the town is very passionate about. This next segment takes a look at Little Compton set to the 1970s poem, Our Town, by Ian M. Walker. Filmmaker duo Lily and Cameron Clark shared this footage. Our Town by Ian M. Walker. And I thought to myself, how nice it is to be able to live in a town like this, where people are real and compassionate too, who care for the many instead of the few. And I thought to myself, how long will it last for man to hearken to those of the past who worked in the soil to build a town whose quiet and beauty have won it renown? And I thought to myself, they loved this place, living in dignity with consummate grace, toiling from sunrise to sunset close, farming the land of Patton's prose. And I thought to myself, in ages gone, what man had done was create a song whose grandeur speaks from days of yore, from quicksand pond to Scunnet's shore. And I thought to myself, what must we do to ensure a place for those others too? Dreamers of dreams for solitude rare, midst green country setting and sweet salt air. And I said to myself, this gift is ours, meadows and fields and bright holly bowers, entrusted to us by those who cared, granting to theirs the gift they shared. And I said to myself, we who live now must pass to those only who keep the vow, that this fair place shall continue to be theirs to enjoy through eternity. Enjoy the rest of this episode and the entire Our Town series at watch.ripbs.org. Next, Story in the Public Square co-host Jim Ludis talks with author and theologian Tara Isabella Burton about her latest book, The World Cannot Give. It's, it's set in a private boarding school. Uh, and it sort of it, it had it sort of reminded me of, of Hogwarts with Instagram, right? Like there's 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 these these very modern elements set in this very traditional setting, but these young ladies are drawn to sort of these transcendent questions about belonging, and they do so in a way that's both youthful and uh, and 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 what you would expect of 16 and 17 year olds, but profound at the same time. I wonder if you could sort of walk us through a little bit how you came to tell this particular story. Um, I really wanted to capture something particular about my own experience at a New England boarding school, uh, albeit not one with a lovely view of, uh, of the coastline. Um, and it was that very academically inclined, uh, book smart teenagers, people who've read too much and thought or think they're thinking too much, but don't have the emotional maturity or the life experience to to back that up or to discern what from all of the books they've read and the philosophers whose arguments have heard uh, should be uh, taken seriously, taken with a grain of salt. And um, I think that what I wanted to capture in this book is um, what I love most about the campus novel, which is that it's this kind of like, um, black box, as it were, uh, this, this sort of experimental arena where ideas really seem to matter. And for the, the students at St. Dunstan's, in particular, the uh, members of this chapel choir that make up the main choirs, the, excuse me, the main characters of the book, um, I wanted to explore what happens when well-meaning, uh, hungry people, and I think all of the characters, even, even Virginia, are initially well-meaning, uh, what happens when they take ideas too seriously and, and let, it, um, let it affect them and let it corrode them? So I, I probably should have begun the, the, the discussion of the book with this question, but for folks who have not read it yet, what's that 30,000-foot overview without giving too much away? Uh, it's the uh, relationship between uh, two young women, uh, Laura, a newcomer to the school, and uh, Virginia, the fanatically uh, obsessive, kind of intense, slightly terrifying member of the chapel choir of this local boarding school. And uh, Laura falls under the spell, not just of, of music, singing in this 
somewhat obsolete chapel choir, one of the last of its kind, but the kind of cult that has sprung up around Virginia and the uh, boys of the choir who see themselves as inheritors to this lost tradition, the lost uh, magic of a certain kind of uh, quasi-religious environment, and uh, the legacy of a controversial writer, Sebastian Webster, who is the school's most famous and infamous alumnus, who died fighting in the Spanish Civil War. Watch the full episode on watch.ripbs.org and tune in for Story in the Public Square Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore Sunday mornings at 11. And now here's a preview of what's coming next month on Rhode Island PBS. Ocean State Sessions, now in its second season, features local musicians performing original music along with insightful interviews about their inspiration and craft. This next segment comes from an episode premiering in April and features Neil McCarthy performing Pretty Peggy O. Stepping down the stairs, pretty Peggy. I'm stepping down the stairs, pretty Peggy. 
Stepping down the stairs Combing back your yellow hair Bid a last farewell To your will If ever I return Pretty Peggy If ever I return, pretty penny If ever I return, the cities I will burn Destroy all the people Watch season two of Ocean State Sessions Sundays at 10 p.m. Plus, enjoy exclusive online content at watch.ripbs.org. Thank you for joining us this month. We'll see you next time in case you missed it.